Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name's Tim Broom. A lot of you probably know me. I'm taking your lesson today because Robert's up in Mildura. He's playing tennis up there at the moment and I think he might be attending the chess at the weekend. Okay, so we've had a little poll question up on the screen and the choices were for our first move on the microbase position. Is it Bishop G6 check? or is it king to b2, or is it something else? Now some of you have responded, and I'm going to tell you now the answer is something else. So I'm going to choose somebody in a moment, and I'm going to ask you to try and tell me what you think it is. Okay, I'm going to unmute Haran now. Haran, are you there? Haran, can you tell me the best move for white in this position? Aran, are you there? Aran, have you got an idea for the best move for white in the position on the microphone? No. You don't? Okay, let's see if anybody else does. I'm going to try Daniel. Daniel Pobrozovsky. Can, Can you think of it? I'm thinking King B2. Thinking King B2. Okay, let's see if anybody else. What about Bobby? Bobby Zhang. Yeah. Do you have a best move here, Bobby? Bobby there? Okay, let's try Lachlan Martin. Hello. No? Okay. Hello. All right. Maybe I'm going to show you the, the first move. The key to this is that if you play king b2, then the knight can escape over to b5. All right. So if king goes to b2, then the knight can escape to b5. So the point is that before you play the king to b2, you need to trap the knight on the edge of the board. Now, who can see how you can trap that knight on the edge of the board? Heath, what about you? Heath Gooch, can you tell me the answer? Bishop d3. Bishop d3 is a fantastic move. Well done. And what you'll notice is that Bishop g6 actually fails to win the game. It's a check for the sake of playing a check. The king moves to d7 and all of a sudden it's too late to play bishop to d3 because now the king comes to c6 and when the king attacks the knight b5 is now protected by the king. So bishop to d3, just always remember that a bishop three squares away from a knight on the edge of the board means that that knight has got no square that it can move to. So we've trapped the knight on the edge of the board and then the next move, very simply, is to play king to b2. And then the knight will be captured. Very good. Okay. Now, today, I have with me Ben Durkin. Now, Ben Durkin, how old are you, Ben? I'm, I'm 11. You're 11. Now, Ben, what school did you go to, Ben? I'm Tucker Road. Goes to Tucker Road Primary. Um, now, Ben recently played in the Vic Youth Championships. And I'm very pleased he's here today because I was watching some of his games in the Vic Youth. And the one thing that I noticed with Ben was that he was scoring a lot of points with black. I think in the Vic Youth, I don't know whether he played three or four games with black, but he had three victories with the black pieces. And that's very nice to see because I like to see people playing for a win when they're playing with black and not to think that white's got an advantage. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at one of Ben's games from the Vic Youth Championships. Um, I've chosen this one that Ben played against Jared Nottle. And Ben was playing with black, um, and Ben did win the game. But it's quite an interesting game, and I want to see if we can make some observations about it on the way and try and see some of the, place, some of the things that Ben did right 
and that Jared did right, and maybe some of the things that they might have done better. So let's um, start with the game. It's a, a normal e4 opening at the beginning of the game. Ben played his pawn to d6, which is a nice flexible move. Um, he hasn't quite necessarily decided on his whole plan for the game yet. Maybe depends on what white does. But d6 is a nice flexible move. You can uh, play the um, the kingside bishop to g7 in some variations, g6 and bishop g7. Um, in some variations you might uh, play c6 and knight d7, but in this game we'll see that Ben actually transposed to what's called Philidor's defense. This normally is arrived at by a different move order, e4, e5, knight f3 first, and then defending the pawn with d6. But this position is much more common in a Philidor. And this is actually the same position after Ben's next move as happened in the very famous Opera House game that Paul Morphy played, in which Paul Morphy exchanged the uh, pawn on e5 next. But um, Jared didn't do that. Jared chose to bring his bishop out. And um, Ben then played a very aggressive move. He played his pawn to d5. Now, do you remember playing that move, Ben? Um, playing pawn to d5? No, not really. Okay, because in your first four moves of the game, you have actually played two moves with the same pawn. So at the beginning of the game, you thought you wanted the pawn on d6 and now you've moved it to d5. It's a very aggressive move attacking the center of the board, but it's giving white opportunity to capture one of those pawns. But it's very trappy now because um, the central pawns may well be exchanged early in the game, which means that if anybody gets their king stuck in the center, then there could be trouble down one of the open files. Because um, Ben in particular hasn't got many of his back row pieces out before he started attacking the center of the board. All right, um, now Jared brought, uh, brought his bishop out to d3, and Ben exchanged some pawns in the middle of the board. And now he's trying to develop his pieces, getting his knight out to c6. All right, and Jared decided to push forward to d5. May not be the best move, but it's, um, it's a good idea to keep the center nice and closed and Ben brought his knight out to d4. Jared brought his queen forward. It's not really attacking the knight because, of course, the knight's defended by that bishop on f8. And now Ben played an interesting move. He still didn't... I would be trying to play safe here, I think, and trying to develop my pieces. So I would be thinking of maybe bringing the knight out to attack the bishop on e4, but uh, Ben decided to play an even more aggressive move and he pushed his pawn forward to f5. Okay, now, the nice thing about this move is that it's attacking the bishop and if the bishop moves back to d3, bishop moves back to d3, then the pawn will come forward, attacking both the bishop and the knight at the same time. All right, so Ben's got a very nasty little attack here, but in fact, it is possible for white to save the piece. Now, can anybody see how White can save his bishop. That's my question. How can White save the bishop in this position? Okay. Anybody see how White can save the bishop? Bishop is a tricky question. I'm going to unmute somebody. How about Max? Can you see how White can save the piece here? He moves his bishop back to d3 then you've got the fork with the pawn on e4. But in fact, Ben's move f5 is a little bit loosening, and it is possible for white not to lose a piece here. Can you see the move, Max? 
Anybody else? I'm going to briefly unmute. Let's have a go with Oliver. Let's see if Oliver can see a move. Oliver, can you see how he can save his bishop? Maybe by attacking a black piece. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Might have to help you here. Um, what he can actually do in this position is to take the pawn on e5. And then if Ben captures the bishop, then the knight on e5 can take Ben's bishop as well. So they both lost one piece. So Ben's move f5 may not be the best way to attack that bishop. I was thinking maybe knight to f6 might be a better way of doing it, because it attacks the bishop and it also develops a piece and gets Ben one move closer to getting his king castled. So this move f5 is a very trappy move, but I think with knight takes e5, Jared could still have maybe have gained an advantage in this position. Okay, so in the game, Jared actually played his bishop out to g5. Now that's attacking the queen on d8, so Ben doesn't have time to take the bishop just yet. The position's getting quite complicated. There are quite a lot of pieces which can all be will be taken. So both players have to be quite careful here. Ben blocked it with his bishop. But this is um, a little bit tricky as well because now Jared captured the knight, sorry, the pawn with his knight. Now Ben wanted, I think, to take the bishop on g5. Um, well, what that does is it actually leaves the knight on b4 available for capture. There's a knight there on b4 which can be taken. The bishop on e7 is the only piece which is defending the knight on b4 as well. Knight e5. Okay, so in fact he did take on g5. And Ben, instead of taking the knight, beg your pardon, Jared, instead of taking the knight on b4, I think he missed that move. And I think that's one thing that Jared was doing in this game. He was moving a little bit quickly. And the first move that he saw, he often played it. And if he'd, if he'd like the look of f4 to attack the bishop, but maybe instead of playing f4, he should have waited, had a look around from other moves, and he may have seen that the knight on b4 was available for capture. So Ben's bishop is now attacked on g5, and he dropped it back again protecting his knight. So Ben has actually won a piece here. He's won a whole bishop. So he's feeling quite happy with his position. But Jared now starts to attack. He dropped his bishop back first. Which was then taken. And then he's hoping, Ben's hoping to get his king castled. He's trying to move his queen out of the back row so that he can castle on the queen's side. But Jared's on the attack now and he doesn't want to give him a chance to do that. Ben moved his bishop back to h5 and that allowed Jared to take this quite important pawn on f5. And Ben is at least two moves now away from getting his king castled and there are pieces starting to move around the, the area of his king. So there's a possible check here on e6 with the queen, and in the meantime the bishop is attacked on h5 as well. And uh, Ben dropped his bishop back, the knight takes the bishop, the pawn takes the knight, and the queen takes the pawn with check. Um, but it's not too bad because the king's got a nice safe square on f8, potentially also opening up a nice file for attacking the, uh, the white king. And Jared's trying to get his pieces out, and Ben played a good check. And Jared chose to block this check with his knight. All right. 
So I'm going to ask a little question now, which I'm going to put up on the screen, and I'm going to show you the answers to the questions. Just one moment, please. Okay, I'm not just sorry, I'm just having technical difficulty with the question there, so I'll ask the question instead. The the white knight on e4 is pinned by the black queen. Now it is defended by the queen, but my question is what is the best way for black to take advantage of the pin of the knight? Okay, so here we go. I'm going to share this question with you now. I'm going to ask the question, I'll put the screen back in one moment. Okay, so. All right, so my choices here are, we have the choice of playing um, the queen to b4, check. We have rook to e8. We have a rook to h6 and we have bishop takes on b2, attacking the rook in the corner. Now perhaps you'd like to make a choice of one of those, and I should just launch your questions now. I'll go back to the screen a little bit later so you can have another look. Let's see if anybody wants to vote already. Okay, good. We've got some people for going, going for all of the answers actually. Our most uh, popular choice is our rook across to e8. Now rook to e8 is actually the strongest move because the knight is only protected by the queen. The knight is pinned and it cannot move and with the rook on e8 the queen and the rook are both attacking the knight and there isn't another white piece which can come and protect it. Rook to h6 is a decent try because it gets the rook into the game and attacks the queen. And it may allow, in fact, still allow you to play rook e8 on the next move. So rook h6 I think is a, is a good move as well. Some people, two people I think have gone for bishop takes b2 which was a move Ben played in the game. So some people want to go for that. One person has gone for queen to b4 check. I mean, they're all quite good moves but rook to e8 really takes advantage of the pin and it'll win the knight and it'll leave white without enough pieces really to go attacking um, attacking the, the black king there on f8. But what uh, Ben chose in the game was to play bishop takes b2. All right, and um, the rook comes to b1 and Ben played a check. And of course the knight is still pinned, so it's not possible um, to capture the bishop. So the king moves breaking the pin, so now the bishop isn't safe. And what Ben did was he brought his queen over onto the queen side of the board. And that is a bit of a dangerous move because he's leaving his king a little bit unprotected with the queen and the knight around it now. So he's trying to pick up a few pawns on the queen side, but um, he's leaving his own king a little bit less safe than it was before. And um, Jared tried to uh, stop the queen from getting back in the center of the board by blocking that diagonal with his pawn, possibly also trying to get his pawn through towards the back row. So he's played an aggressive move. Jared's trouble is he's only got two pieces around the king. He'd like to get one of his rooks into the game as well. Now, Ben then captured a pawn and attacked the rook. Now, can anybody see what Ben might have missed when he played that move? Let's see who can um, have a go at that one. What about Michaela? Can you see what Ben might not have noticed, uh, Michaela? When he took the pawn on A2 with his queen, has he left something unprotected? Um, 
Can't hear Michaela. I'm going to try Sam. Sam, what has uh, Ben left un unprotected when he put it, took the pawn on a2 with his queen? Um, he left the bishop hanging on c2, c3. Yeah. Yes, and with with the knight on c3, what's what job will that knight be doing as well on c3? I'm um, protecting the rook at the same time as capturing capturing the bishop. Same time, very good. Thank you very much, Sam. Excellent. So he made a little bit of a mistake there. He hadn't noticed that the knight taking the bishop would be defending the rook. But um, Jared didn't do that straight away. He um, brought his queen into attack the king, and um, then he moved his king forward. So he's defending his rook with his other rook from h1. And now the chance is gone. And Ben is a very, very dangerous attacking player. Once uh, he gets a, a sniff of an attack going on the enemy king, he gets his pieces around it. And he normally finishes his games off very quickly from what I've seen. So um, that last move by Jared was a mistake, bringing his king up to f2. He had a chance to take the bishop there on c3 with his knight, and then the queen would be defending his c2 pawn, and everything would be protected. But instead of that, he played his king to f2, and now Ben's the one who's got the attack going. And he manages to capture a piece. He's now two pieces ahead. And um, if you've ever seen Ben play, he finishes these games off at lightning speed. He's very good. He took the queen. Um, Jared missed that as well. He should have... Um, uh, captured the queen and just being two pieces behind. Captured the pawn. Pawn came to g3 and Ben had a checkmate there on f2. All right, so Ben played a good attacking game there, but there were chances on both sides because both players played a little bit loosely. And one thing I would say is that both of the players were sometimes playing the first move that they could see. And it's a very, very common mistake, particularly among younger chess players, that you see a move and you um, think, OK, that'll do. It looks like a good move, and you play it. Now, there's two or three things wrong with that approach. Number one, it may be a good move, but there could be a better one. And even if you think your move's a good move, it's always a very good idea to just, instead of picking up your piece and playing it, to remember that move and then go and have a look to see if you can find any other moves. And you might find that you, there's one move or two other moves that you think look quite promising and then you've got some candidate moves and you can look at, look at all of them together and uh, see which one is the best move to play. So um, it's always a good idea to look for more than one possible move. And also if you play your move too quickly, you won't have taken time just to see if there's anything wrong with it. Because the most common mistake in chess is to put a piece on a square where it isn't safe. It sounds obvious that we shouldn't do that, but the most common mistake is to put a, square, a piece on a square where it's not safe. And um, you will uh, probably all have been guilty of that in, in recent tournaments. And most of us do it at some point in our life. And the more that you can cut that mistake out of your game, the better your results will be because it's very it's a shame to play 20 or 25 really really good chess moves and then play one where you put your queen or your rook on a square where it can be taken and um, you uh, lose the game. Now I've got one more question about this game and I'm just having difficulty getting the questions up so I'm hoping Garen was just going to pop in and help me there. Um, I have one more question to do with the game. Put my questions back up again, please. Sorry about this. Gary just putting my question up. First time I've used this software. That was polls, not questions. Good. Thank you. OK, so my question is, what did neither player do in this game as well as they might have done? And the choices are, did they fail to look for all their captures before each move? Did they fail to castle? Did they fail to develop their pieces before attacking? 
or all of the above. Let's see what results we're getting here. Okay, most of you are starting to lean towards all of the above. The first time they went up, people started were clicking on castle straight away because neither player got their king castle. But I, I think the correct answer to this is all of the above. All right. Now, um, there were occasions where they didn't look for all the captures before they made their move. They certainly didn't get their king castled. And I remember Ben right back on the very fourth move of the game, if we go back to it. Remember on the fourth move of the game, he played his second move with his D pawn. And he's already going for a really attacking game in the center of the board. And that was before he'd got either of his knights out, before he'd got his king's bishop out, before he'd got any idea of where his king was going to get castled to. And um, these are the, the very common mistakes that people make when they're learning to play chess. Looking for all of the captures before every move if you can, and in particular looking to see if the square you're putting your piece on is safe. In particular, asking yourself, what does my opponent's last move threaten? Looking out to see if there are any checks you might play, that kind of thing. And developing your pieces before attacking. I really like to see all of the knights and all of the bishops out off the back row and the king safely castled before you start opening up the center with moves like d5 in this position. But having said that, I would certainly congratulate Ben on his play because Ben has got a really good eye for tactics. I met Ben at a, at a holiday camp that we had um, a few months ago and he was playing some really, really exciting attacking games and he was always uh, had an eye for tactics and I noticed that he was missing some captures and he was occasionally losing a piece where um, his opponent had a, had a chance to take a piece for nothing but he was always moving his pieces out and trying to attack the king and in particular trying to take advantage of when his king, um, uh, when his opponent's king was stuck in the center as well. So uh, I think Ben's a very, very promising chess player and it was really good to see him playing all these, all these wins with the black pieces um, in, uh, in the Vic Youth Championship. And that game we've just seen, although his opponent blundered his queen at the end, by that time Ben did have a winning attack coming with all his pieces attacking the king. So that was a good game, Ben. That was well played. When's your next tournament going to be, Ben? Um, have you got any more tournaments this year? I don't think so. You don't think so. All right. So what are you going to be doing for chess over the Christmas holidays? Um, I'm probably going to come to another one for holidays. Good. Okay. Because I think you came to um, more than one session of the of the last two holiday camps we've had. Yeah. And that's good. And hopefully we'll be... Um, seeing you at the Vic Youth Championship. Uh, Vic Youth Championship, by the way, everybody, um, a number of you were there, and I thought it was a, a fantastic tournament. And in the, in the past at the Vic Youth, we've always had everybody recording their, give them extra time so they can record their moves with a pen and paper. And then a, go, they go off with a coach and analyze the game after the, afterwards. But this year we didn't use pens and papers, did we, Ben? We were using yeah. iPads for the whole tournament. So we managed to get an iPad on every single board. So all the games were going live on Tornello. And we had a beautiful lounge room next door where all the parents and friends and anybody who'd finished their game could go and watch Robert and Carl in action. And they were commentating on four live games simultaneously. And every time a game finished, they... Um, just closed that one down and, and opened up another one. So they were up there all day long for the whole weekend commentating on live games, which was um, just an unbelievable experience for all the people who come to see their, their kids playing chess. So um, I would be strongly encouraging all of you to uh, try and get down to the Vic Youth next year and uh, see if you can be part of that experience. It's the first time anywhere in the world, as far as we're aware, that um, anybody's had iPad recording going for the, the whole of the tournament instead of just pen and paper recording because uh, it's very rare that anybody's got enough enough money to have an iPad on every single board. So we were, we were fortunate to have it for the big youth and that was a fantastic tournament. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, Robert will be back next week. I'm just uh, filling in for this one week 
And let's uh, thank you very much to Ben for coming in and um, sharing his game and his experience with us. And um, thank you for that. Actually, I'm going to we've got, we've got another 15 minutes. What I might do is I might just put a different game up on board. And this isn't one of Ben's games. Just going to talk through the development of pieces a little bit. Okay. Now I think just a really useful, it's a very easy thing to do, but a very useful um, way to think about your chess is quite simply counting the number of pieces which you have got out of your back row compared to the number of pieces which your opponent has got out of the back row. And this game, I think, illustrates that very, very well indeed. This is a game without a really big blunder in it. Nobody gives a piece away. Nobody gives their queen away. Nobody blunders away a checkmate in two moves. But very, very quickly, Alexander Alekin, who's a former world champion playing with White, gets a very big advantage in this game. All right. So it's a Caro Can opening where the pawns get exchanged in the middle. White strikes in the center with a second pawn to c4. And now the pieces start coming out of the back row. They both bring a knight out. Black brings a second knight out. And white brings his bishop out. Now, so obviously counting up the pieces that are out from the back row, we've got two white pieces and two black pieces. So it's all fairly even at the moment. But black now has a tricky choice to make because the bishop on g5 is attacking his knight, sorry I flipped the board by mistake, um, it's attacking his knight and the knight is one of two black pieces which is defending the pawn on d5. Okay, there's the knights defending it and there's the queen defending it. And there's two white pieces attacking it, we have the pawn and we have the knight from c3. Okay, so um, if the bishop takes the knight, then the pawn is going to be lost. So black has the choice of whether he's going to play e6 to defend his pawn, or whether he's going to um, capture the pawn on c4 himself. It would be better not to capture the pawn on c4 straight away, because it's better to wait until white has developed his bishop on f1. Because once the bishop has come out of f1, then it'll take two moves, one to move out and then one move to recapture this pawn. So it's good not to take the pawn straight away, but to wait until white has developed his bishop. Okay, so probably e6 is the best move, but black decided to capture the pawn. Okay, now instead of recapturing the pawn straight away, Alexander Alekin pushed his pawn onto d5, attacking the knight, and the knight moved to e5, and we suddenly have the critical position. Let's just count up those back row pieces again. White's got a knight and a bishop out, so he's got two pieces out. Black's got two knights out, also two pieces out. And White played a very, very simple little move. He brought his knight out, attacking the knight on e5. And this move is much, much trickier than you might imagine. It looks like a simple developing move, but black now has a decision to make. If black decides to move his knight, for example, back to g6, then white will capture the pawn on c4, and all of a sudden, let's, um, okay, I'm going to do a different move. Okay, so just edit this for us. If he plays, sorry, knight f3. If he plays his knight back to g6, then the bishop will take the pawn on c4, and we count up the pieces out from the back row. All of a sudden, white has four pieces out, and black has two pieces out. So at least one move of development has been gained by white. And the reason for that, the reason for that is because black has moved a new, the same piece yet again, 
the knight back to g6, and white has brought a new piece out off the back row. Okay, if white, if black is to take the knight on f3, the same thing happens. White recaptures with the queen, and again white has three pieces out off the back row, and black only has the knight. So again a move of development has been gained, because a new piece from the back row, the knight, the white knight from g1, has been exchanged for the black piece which was already out. So white has again gained development time. And the move which which was actually found here by black was even worse because he played a check. It doesn't matter about the fact he loses a pawn because he's a pawn ahead, but after the exchanges the, white, the black knight has moved another time and again the, the white pieces are coming out from the back row and white has actually gained a full two moves of development. He's now got four pieces out of the black back row and black only has one. And black's next move is, is going to take a long time to get castled here because his bishops aren't out. He's got to move a pawn and move a bishop and then castle. So he's three moves away from castling. And his next move, he may have been scared of a piece coming to b5, but his next move doesn't develop anything either. So now white's able to castle. He's got all of his knights and bishops out. He's got his queen out. And now he's got some nice open files in the middle of the board where the rook is coming to. So how on earth is black going to get his king castled and his pieces developed? So he's desperately trying. He played his pawn to e6 to try and get his bishop out. But of course, Alakin now is just bringing his rooks to the middle of the board. He's now got six rook, six pieces almost. The two knights, the bishop, the queen, certainly the rook on d1. And the rook on f1 is going to come to e1. He'll have six pieces in dangerous attacking positions and black's got almost no pieces anywhere. Black, I don't know, not a good move, I don't think, trying to exchange the pawns in the middle of the board and open the e-file. Alakin exchanged his bishop for the knight, recaptured with the queen, he captured with the knight, and the queen couldn't find anywhere better than to go back home again. And you look at the position, what has black achieved in this game at all? He's moved one pawn forward to a6. Apart from that, all of his remaining pieces are on their starting squares. His king is still two moves away from castling. His queen's rook can't come out because his queen's bishop hasn't come out. And there are wide open files in the middle of the board trying to check and attack the king before it gets safe. And um, our king found that I would have probably played rook e1, rook f to e1 automatically here, but it's a good move. But Alexander Alakin found an even cleverer move. He sacrificed his knight on f6. Now that's a check, and it opens up an attack by the queen and the rook together on the black queen. So black has no choice but to capture with the queen. And Alakin played his rook across to e1 with a check. Now there's two ways to escape this check with either bishop, either the bishop to d, sorry, from c8 to e6, or the bishop from f8 to e7. In the game, the bishop came to e6, and I'll just unmute somebody and see who can tell me what the checkmating move is here. What about Uvini? Can you find the checkmate move for white? Uvini, can you, can you hear me? Um, yes. Um, is it queen d7? It is queen to d7, very good. And the bishop is pinned, so there's no way that um, that queen can be captured. If Instead of um, bishop e6, play the other bishop to e7, then we have a different checkmate. Yuvini, would you like to tell me the checkmate this time? Queen d8. Queen d8 is still checkmate because the bishop, although it's on e7 instead of e6, is still pinned. 
But I like that game. It's a simple game. There are no really, really big errors in it. But all Black didn't take care of was getting the pieces out as quickly as White. Following those three golden rules. If you can follow the three golden rules, that's great. But if you can stop your opponent from doing it as well, then that's when you get lines opening up against the king that's stuck in the middle of the board. Because if you don't get your pieces out, then you can't get your king castled. And those central files tend to open up for the rooks and the queen against the, the king in the middle of the board. All right. Good. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, just a good technique for, for people to think about. Just always be aware of how many pieces you've got out of the back row compared to your opponent. If we go back and think about Ben's game that we looked at earlier in that context, Jared was actually the first one to get his pieces out of the back row. He was, did it more quickly than, than Ben did because Ben was trying to find attacking ways before he developed his pieces. We got a bishop out pinning the knight, but Jared brought his bishops out while Ben was moving his pawns around the middle. So Jared in this position had two bishops and the knight already out of the back row, and Ben only had his, had his bishop out. So Jared was at least one move, possibly two moves ahead in development at this stage of the game, um, and that's dangerous. Now, Ben turned out to be okay. King never got into any serious danger. But um, you, it really is a good idea before you start moving these pawns forward. And remember, Ben's F pawn came forward later as well. Okay, he brought F, F5 as well. He's weakening his king position while he's still quite a long, lot of moves away from getting the king castle. Now, he was all right. He, didn't, uh, he survived in this game. But uh, just thinking about making sure that you're never behind on how quickly those pieces are getting out of the back row is a really, really good, um, good thing to, to be thinking about. And that's what I like about that, that Alekin game. Alexander Alekin was um, world champion back in the 1920s. He won a famous world championship match against Capablanca. And then... Um, he ended up losing his world title slightly unexpectedly uh, against a Dutch player called Max Erber. And Alexander Alekin's problem was, although he was a great chess player and he absolutely loved chess, he thought about it in his sleep and in his waking moments and uh, all the time. Uh, but uh, his other problem was that he used to drink too much wine. And uh, he was, uh, wasn't a very well man by the time he played uh, his World Championship match against Max Erva. And I think he, he lost, the, lost the match for that reason very unexpectedly. And he, he died fairly young. He died in his, uh, in his 40s. I think he was about 49. I'll be 49 next year. I'm hoping to last a little bit longer than he did. All right, so um, it is about 7.15 now. I'm just going to unmute all of you just momentarily to see if anybody has any questions for myself or Ben before we finish up. Actually, I'm not doing too well unmuting individually. Anybody got anything they'd like to ask before we finish? No. No, okay. Uh, okay. All right. Then. Thank you very much. I'll mute, mute you all again. Thank you for coming to the um, online lecture today. As I say, Robert will be back uh, next week doing it regularly. I apologize because I was a bit, little bit of a beginner with the software here, the, um, the meeting software. So I'm pleased to have used this this time because I shall be much more slick with it next time I use it, hopefully. It's all about learning and improving for all of us, isn't it? So uh, I thank you all very much for coming. And uh, we'll see you at a tournament very soon, I hope. Bye-bye for now.